kiddos, uh, here we are again on to another chapter of the book that was published in 1864 by J.T. Headley, those uh, chaplains, or the chaplains and clergy of the revolution. Folks, uh, just delighted that you can join my uh, grandchildren virtually. I have four grandchildren, and it is a, an honor and delight to be able to read this amazing book to them. I, I just, every time, every chapter, uh, I, I am just more amazed at these uh, chaplains, these clergy, these ministers of God, these uh, presidents of the universities of the day, and that they spoke liberty. Not just liberty in Christ, but they spoke liberty politically. And uh, you know what? We just don't have the numbers of pastors or uh, academic leaders that are doing that this very day. So as a result, we have all the ills, we have all the evils that we see in government because children, as the Anti-Federalists have told us, is that uh, it, it needed to be from the pulpits and that uh, even John Adams, who was a Federalist, and Madison said that our Constitution, our form of governance, was for a moral and religious people. So as we continue, I don't want to belabor this, but get into uh, chapter 18 of the chaplains and clergy of the Revolution. Naphtali Daggett, the professor of divinity in Yale College, the college broken up, invasion of Tryon, terror of the inhabitants, a company of a hundred young men raised to resist him. Dr. Daggett and his black mare advances alone to reconnoiter. The fight, the retreat. Dr. Daggett refuses to run. Interview with the British officer. Forced to guide the column. Brutal treatment. Rescued by a Tory. His sickness and death. That's what we're going to capture out of this. And I want you to pay attention. This is extremely important, especially if there happens to be any pastors or or church clergymen listening, or even, anyway, you Christians, I hope you listen to this one in particular. So pay attention again to what I just said, and here we go. Naphtali Daggett, Doctor of Divinity, Professor of Divinity, and for a time President of Yale College, was another distinguished clergyman who was as illustrious for his patriotism as for his theological learning. He instructed the students in the duty of resistance to Great Britain as earnestly as he did in that of obedience to God. Indeed, he regarded them as one and the same duty. In 1779, the college had recovered from the panic that had scattered the students into various towns in the interior and was in a prosperous condition. But in the midst of its tranquility, a rumor reached New Haven that General Tryon was preparing to make a descent upon it. The place was immediately thrown into great alarm, and a meeting was called to deliberate on what was to be done. Councils were various as to the best course to pursue, but Dr. Daggett declared that whatever else was determined upon one thing was clear. The citizens must fight. At length, the dreaded calamity came, and swift riders galloped into town, bringing the startling news that the British, 2,500 strong, had landed about five miles distance at West Haven. At once, all was confusion and terror, the college was hurriedly broken up, and, as all regarded it useless to attempt to resist so large a body of regular troops, it was determined that early in the morning the inhabitants and students would take their flight into the interior and leave the place to the mercy 
of the marauders. To give the former as much time as possible to remove their goods, a volunteer company of a hundred young men was formed to retard the march of the British by beating back their advance guard. Accordingly, they assembled on the green with such arms as they could lay their hands on and paraded in front of the deserted college. The streets were filled with the terrified fugitives as in wagons, on horseback, and on foot. They streamed towards the country. It was a scene of wild confusion and contrasted strangely with that courageous little detachment preparing to go forth against such an overwhelming force. At length, everything being ready, drum and fife, and fife struck up doo -doo 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 -doo, a lively strain, and taking up its line of march, the band passed out of the city. It had not proceeded far when the clatter, the clatter of horse hoofs was heard along the road, and the next moment the reverend professor of divinity galloped up on his old black mare with a long following piece in his hand. He had not contented himself with giving good patriotic advice, but had resolved to set an example. To their surprise, however, he did not stop to join them, but pushed straight on towards the enemy. The little band gave him a loud cheer as he passed, but the old man never turned to the right or to the left, but dashed resolutely onward, and ascending a hill, halted in a grove and commenced reconnoitering the enemy. The detachment, turning a little to the south, swept around the base of the hill and kept on until they came in sight of the advance guard of the British. When throwing themselves behind uh, fences, they poured a destructive volley. The guard halted and returned fire, but as volley succeeded volley, each more deadly than the last, they turned and fled. The young volunteers then broke cover and, leaping the fence, pursued them, firing and shouting as they went, driving them from fence to fence and across field after field. They kept courageously on till they suddenly found themselves face to face with the whole hostile army. As far as the eye could reach, on either side of the green fields were red with scarlet uniforms, the extended wings ready at the word of command to enfold them and cut off every avenue of escape. Suddenly halting and taking in the full extent of the danger, they, without waiting for orders, turned and ran for their lives. As they fled along the base of the hill, on the top of which Dr. Daggett had taken his station, they saw the venerable man quietly watching the advancing enemy. As the noise and confusion of their flying detachment reached his ears, he turned a quiet glance below, then leveling his following piece at the foe, blazed away. As the British pressed after the fugitives, they were surprised at the solitary report of a gun every few minutes from the grove of trees on that hill. At first they paid little attention to it, but the bullets finding their way steadily into the ranks, they were compelled to notice it, and an officer sent a detachment up to see what it meant. The professor saw them coming, but never moved from his position. His black mare stood near him, and he could any moment have mounted and fled, but this seemed never to have entered his head. He was thinking only of the enemy, and loaded and fired as fast as he could. When the, detach when the detachment reached the spot where he stood, the commanding officer, to his surprise, saw only a venerable man in black before him quietly loading his gun to have another shot. Pausing a moment at the extraordinary spectacle of a single man thus coolly fighting a whole army, he exclaimed, quote, What are you doing there, you old fool, firing on His Majesty's troops? The staunch old patriot looked up in the 
most unconcerned manner and replied, quote, exercising the rights of war, end quote. The whole affair seemed to strike the officer comically and rather amused than offended at the audacity of the proceeding, he said, quote, If I let you go this time, you old rascal, will you ever fire again on the troops of his majesty? End quote. Quote, Nothing more likely, end quote, was the imperturbable reply. This was too much for the good temper of the Briton, and he ordered this man seized. They did so, and dragged him roughly down the hill to the head of the column. The Americans in their retreat had torn down the bridge over the river after crossing it, thus compelling the British to march two miles farther north to another bridge. The latter immediately placed Dr. Daggett on foot at the head of the column as a guide and pressed rapidly forward. It was the 5th of July and one of the hottest days of the year. Under the burning rays of the noonday sun and the driving pace they were kept at, even the hardened soldiers wilted, while Dr. Daggett, unused to such exposure, soon became completely exhausted. But the moment he showed signs of faltering, the soldiers pricked him on with their bayonets, at the same time showering curses and insults upon his head. Before the five miles march was completed, the brave old man was ready to sink to the earth, but every time he paused and reeled as if about to fall, they caught him up with the point of their bayonets and forced him to rally while the blood flowed in streams down his dress. As they entered the streets of the town, they commenced shooting down the peaceable citizens who had remained behind. Whenever they appeared in sight, and Dr. Daggett expected every moment to share their fate. At length, they reached the green, when a Tory, who had come out to welcome the enemy, recognized Dr. Daggett as he lay covered with blood and dust and requested the officer to release him. He did so, and the wounded patriot was carried into a house nearby more dead than alive. His utter exhaustion and brutal wounds combined brought him to the very gates of death, and his life for some time was despaired of. He, however, rallied and was able a part of the next year to preach in the chapel, but his constitution had received a shock from which it could not fully recover, and in sixteen months he was born to the grave. One more added to the list of noble souls who felt that the offer of their lives to their country was a small sacrifice. Wow. My children, I, I, I have to tell you, this is uh, an amazing man. Dr. Daggett was already an aged individual. He was the president of Yale University. And one of the things that he taught people and the students was that Christianity and resistance to evil go hand in hand. You're never going to hear that in your modern churches. Will you, pastors? Most likely not, unless it's a pastor that understands what Dr. Daggett, what the Reformation was all about, what our founding fathers believed. He stood. He fought. He was never going to give in to evil and tyranny. And, obviously, he was treated badly for it. He was stabbed with the bayonet for over five miles of marching. And, uh, he, it's amazing, he survived. Well, we have so many more chapters to go. And this was chapter 8. And we're going to get to chapter 9 in a little bit. And chapter 9 is a gentleman by the name of Ezra Stiles. And we'll get to that in a few minutes.